Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome back to Turn the Page. I am your host for today, Jen, and I am here with an extraordinarily accomplished uh, film critic and film writer with whom I am very excited to speak about a really exciting and beautiful new book. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Sure. My name is John H. Foote. I'm a Canadian uh, film critic, and I've written a book called Cinema of the 70s, 101 Iconic Films. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I... You're very welcome. I was I had so much fun reading this book. Um, it was a period of film with with which I am a little bit familiar. Like I've seen a lot of the sort of extremely uh, seminal films from the time, but there was a lot for me to learn about here. Um, before we get too much into the book itself, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, you know maybe your journey uh, to the book because as you said you are a film critic and you have written on film before um, so could you tell us a little bit about where this project came from? Sure I was teaching um, at the Toronto Film School I was actually the dean at the time and we were searching for uh, history books decent books that, that would cover a decade at a time for the kids and there just weren't any. I mean, there were the old Citadel press books by Doug Brody, but they were dated. And it just I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a book that celebrated decade by decade by decade, a hundred or so films, and not necessarily the greatest films, but the bombs, the ones that were pop culture phenomenons or box office hits. And I uh, I sent a proposal off to Palazzo in Britain, and I didn't get anything back, which is you know typical for a writer. But eventually I was cleaning up my spam box and there was a note from Palazzo and it just said, if, if you're in, we're in. And I called them and they, they pitched me right then and there, said, let's do it. And the book was written very quickly, three months. And it was back in their hands and ready to go. So that's that was really it. And I'll do the 80s next and then continue on with the 90s and 2000s and on and on and on. That's incredibly exciting. Um, and what a fast turnaround for such an enormous project. Um, so you have written books on film before. You have written uh, books on the careers of um, Clint Eastwood and, and Steven Spielberg, I saw. And I'm curious, yes. um, how was writing a, a wide overview like this different from those deep dives into one director's work? It was a lot more fun, <laughs> very much more fun. Um, with, with the Eastwood and Spielberg books, I focused on their films. I don't want to do biographies because they're done to death. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did only their movies. So it was, you know, each director has a certain vision, a certain way they work. So you were, you were kind of locked into the way Eastwood worked with each film. And the same with Steven Spielberg. Although Spielberg evolves with every movie. He's, he's, a, he's a genius. So with this, it was more going through the decade and looking how the decade evolved, how the 70s evolved, and how cinema was evolving for American, well, North American audiences at the time. Because it, to this day, it's the most exciting 10-year period in history, I think. That is something that you say in the book, you describe it as, a, yeah, the most impactful 10-year period. And that really got me thinking, because you sort of, um, you do a really great job of explaining the context for that, um, like this sort of backlash to the 50s and the 60s and the sort of like string of kind of blockbustery or big spectacle movies that kind of failed. And mm -hmm. uh, it did get me thinking, like, is that kind of where we are right now, too, like with the, you know, like we were just talking about Marvel right before we started recording, you know, and we've had a couple of Marvel failures now too. Like, do you think we're in a period now where people are sort of uh, rejecting kind of like the dominant uh, form of entertainment right now? Or I hope so. I, I truly do hope so. Um, movies are cyclical. I mean, everything, everything goes around and around and around. And we're back to that point where a, a big movie, a blockbuster movie is what audiences want. Part of that was because of COVID. I mean, Top Gun brought people back into the theaters, so God bless it. But, you know, the, the superhero films, the, the Avengers series was wonderful because it was big and it came to a logical conclusion. So where do they go now? Are they going to recast Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man? Soon, they will, um, because it's all about money. And with the superhero movies, for me, it becomes 
it's not about the character anymore. It's about the guy in the suit. And anybody can be the guy in the suit. I mean, we've had how many Batmans, how many Supermans? And I just, I don't like where it goes. I don't like where it's going. It's it's like reading a comic book. You know, instead you're watching the comic book on screen. And there have been some very good ones. You know, Dark Knight was a masterpiece. Avengers Endgame was terrific. But they're not all that. You know, and we have had some bombs, some big, big bombs. And Hollywood is taking a look, I think, and realizing, wow, maybe maybe this isn't the way to go. It's not working. DC doesn't work. The DC universe. I mean, that's just a big bomb factory, I think. So I hope I hope it's turning around. I mean, it did in the 70s. And uh, at the end of the 60s with the musicals that were coming out and the, the biblical blockbusters, audiences just didn't go anymore. They wanted to see movies about who they were. Mm -hmm. They wanted films about what was happening in the world right now, Vietnam, Watergate. There was an urgency to great movies that was exciting. And the audiences were sophisticated and intelligent enough that they they turned on to those. And it led to a, an incredible time for movies. Yeah, there the book really shows that there was um an absolute um uh, just we we were spoiled <laughs> for choice in that period as i think i said we were before. you're right you're right and just so many genres and so many different um aesthetics and also like concerns and different issues that people were thinking about and one of the things that impressed me so much about this book was that it covers um you know some of like the the, the film canon that has been like well celebrated and some less obvious choices that gave me some really great directions for my viewing in the future and sort of gave me a more nuanced understanding of like what was happening for film in this period so i'm curious like how did you make those choices um did you have to re-watch a lot of stuff in the process of making this or like how do you narrow down such a huge body of work into 101 examples i think the first list was 422 <laughs> i just started cutting from there and they suggested the publisher suggested we go with 101 they said because if you do 100 you're going to get asked all the time what would be the next one what'd you miss what'd you miss uh, okay all right let's do 101 and I got it down to 110, and that's when it got really tough, was was the last nine to leave out. It killed me to leave out Little Big Man. Little Big Man should be in there, and I'm sorry it's not. There just wasn't room. But, you know, some of the choices, I've, I've answered some questions about Black Sunday, which is still, I think, the greatest film ever made about international terrorism. Mm -hmm. And it opened in 77. It was in theaters two weeks and bombed. And it was Paramount's big movie for the year. That was their Oscar film. And yet it had to be in there because it's still, as I say, the best film I've ever seen about terrorism. And it holds up. I watched it again and it was every bit as great as it was the first time. So th that was a, a big mark for me. It had to have the same impact it had the first time I saw it. You know, for, for the films that are a little lesser in the book, I had to be able to explain why they were they were not as strong. Like Gatsby, Gatsby was never a great film. Redford was the wrong choice to play Gatsby. Mia Farrow, oh, <laughs> let's go the other way completely. But it was just a mess, with the exception of Bruce Dern, who was spectacular as Tom Buchanan, and uh, the costumes, the set designs, you know, were certainly certainly outstanding. So I, I tried to include, you know, the great films, The Godfather, Apocalypse Now, the mid films, um, the pop culture films, Saturday Night Fever, and a few of the the duds that had to be in there because they they're so much a part of the decade, so much a part of the time and what was happening. Yeah, the the message that you really get from, I guess, a large array of these movies, even like the ones that might seem a little bit more escapist, like Star Wars, you know, they're still dealing with very real issues that were you know people were thinking about and experiencing at the time and um it seems like there it was this moment where like the studios realized that people didn't really want escapism anymore but wanted things that that showed them things about themselves and about the world that they lived in um yeah. so yeah like um in terms of like why this shift happened um a lot of it has to do with like um directors right and the changing role of directors like in this system can you talk yes. a little bit about that maybe and you know it, it 
it occurs to me now that like when we were talking about Marvel, you know, one of the biggest commentators right now on the Marvel system is Scorsese, who like this is the system that he so, like this is the era rather that he sort of came uh, into his own in, you know. And so he talk about like, yeah, like what the director, like what was happening to the role of director and how does that influence like what's going on here? I think the director had finally been recognized as the absolute artist of the film. They they did everything to create what the film was and they were finally being given credit for that and they had a certain amount of power to make the movies they wanted to make these were young guys the movies weren't that expensive taxi driver was two million dollars so they go do it go do it and he, he makes a masterpiece so they were young they had new ideas they loved cinema i mean they were addicted to cinema so they wanted to merge their new ideas with these old ideas because they loved Lawrence of Arabia and 2000 on the Space Odyssey on the waterfront. They had nothing but respect for those films and filmmakers and wanted to make their own mark. So they they did. They went ahead and they did it. And there's a real darkness in movies from 1970 to about 77. And then Star Wars comes along. And as, as much of a fantasy as Star Wars was, I give George Lucas full credit for making it realistic. Those starships are banged up. They're not beautiful and gleaming. And the creatures, are they look lived in. The worlds look lived in. So he did a great job to make it as realistic as possible, as they did with Superman, Close Encounters, all the, the box office hits that came out after that. I, I love that period of sci-fi in particular, because I, I think just being a child of like the eighties myself. Like I, I loved when the future looked more like a radio shack than like an Apple store, you know, when yes, it was a little yes. and a lot more analog. Um, so yeah, as the director was becoming more important too, um, do you think that like, um, like changes in acting also played a role? Cause I feel like you get like a new crop of actors too, who were doing very different things. And like, you know, the, the golden age of actors that we think of when we think of like the forties and fifties. I think there were two things that happened to American acting in the 1970s, Jane Fonda and Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. And Jane Fonda didn't just kick a door open for women. She kicked it open and stomped on it and said, we can be as real as men. We can be every bit as gritty and honest and powerful and ugly as men on screen. And she did it in They Shoot Horses, Don't They? And Clute, which are stunning performances. Brando was a, par a pariah in Hollywood in the 70s, and yet Coppola wanted him for The Godfather, didn't want anyone else. He wanted this 45-year-old actor to play this 75-year-old Don in The Godfather. Paramount didn't want him, but he got him, and the result was, again, a brilliant performance. Brando's only in that movie 28 minutes, and he won the Academy Award for Best Actor. It's a three-hour movie. And with them came Al Pacino, Robert Duvall, Robert De Niro, Diane Keaton, Sally Field, Joe Clayburgh. I mean, I can go on and on and on about these actors, but it was a, a mecca in a second renaissance in method acting in the United States. And even those that, that claim they weren't method actors, Jack Nicholson has never claimed to be a method actor. He seeks the truth in his work. So he's a method actor. You know, that's that's really all it is. Um, but yeah, there was a huge change in acting in the 1970s. And the actors born out of that time are still every bit as popular as they were back then. They're still working, you know. They're they're in their eighties. Eastwood is ninety one, and he's he's working on a new film, and uh, they just never seem to stop, and they never seem to stop with their quality. Except Al Pacino, I'm going to step on him a little bit. I'm <laughs> sick of the hoo ha. The, he got loud somehow. <laughs> but they're they're still working, and they're still uh, they're still relevant. Mm -hmm. And you know, Streep came along at the end of the seventies, and is still regarded as probably the greatest actor that's ever been. And, you know, born of the 70s. Mm. Yeah, born of the 70s. And sometimes, too, I feel like of um, like really intense collaborations uh, with directors, like over a long period of time. Um, yeah. You yeah. definitely see that with like a lot of Scorsese's actors and some other directors, too. Like, um, it seems like there was like a lot of um, just like space and time for experimentation and collaboration mm -hmm. that doesn't really exist now because everything has to be calculated, you know, to produce, you know, two times as much money as it costs to make, you know, <laughs> like you yeah. don't have that yeah. space. So many movies are born in the boardroom these days, you know, they, they sit around and they come up with an idea. They're not a script, but they got the idea. 
Whereas back then, somebody wrote a script, somebody had an idea, they wrote a script, they got together, and then they thought, let's make it. And that's what De Niro and Scorsese did with Taxi Driver. They knew each other as children. They worked together on Mean Streets. They worked together on this. And again, New York, New York, Raging Bull, and just kept working together till he found DiCaprio. And now he works with him quite a lot together with De Niro in, in Killers for a Flower Moon. But Coppola did the same with Pacino. He worked with him in The Godfather and Godfather Part Two. And Woody Allen found Diane Keaton and worked with her throughout the 1970s. They did work together. They did have collaborations. They did enjoy working together. And they made each other better. You know, they challenged each other. And that's what, you know, Francis Ford Coppola said that in an interview. I spoke with him and he said, it wasn't so much me challenging them. It was them challenging me. And he said, look what happened in The Godfather Part Three when we didn't have Robert Duvall. He's right. He's absolutely right. The movie was a mess because they didn't have Duvall there. I'll get to that in the 90s. <laughs> yeah so um you know speaking of um i'm super interested in what um these next volumes are going to be like um like so obviously the 80s is going to be next um and you know most of my favorite movies sort of come from the 70s 80s and maybe early 90s just because of, i think yes. when I <laughs> and um i'm really curious if you could maybe talk you know, a little bit about what's in store for the 80s volume, because something I think about all the time is like, how did home video change films, you know, and that's got to be an issue <laughs> that's going to come up in the 80s volume. It's a huge issue. Um, one of the things I did for the 70s book was I have a five sections in the book called Intermission, where I talk about a particular time in movies or a director or an actor. And in, in the 80s, it will be home video, the impact of home video, home video changed my life it changed the life of every movie junkie that's out there it changed hollywood it gave movies a second life you know all of a sudden they could fail the box office that's okay because they'll they'll make it on the home end and they did they did and it, it breathed life into movies that had bombed like blowout that brilliant john travolta film that was was a box office dud but found life on video and even heaven's gate found life on video and later dvd from criterion and uh Video has been hugely important. I think it, it's it's given us Blu-ray and streaming and everything else. I mean, whoever thought we'd watch movies at home? Whoever thought that? And sometimes within weeks of the movie being in a theater, we have a, a Blu-ray in our hand or we're watching it on a streaming channel. And it's everything's changed so much in that time. And it, it started with home entertainment. It's something that I, I have a lot of trouble wrapping my head around, I think, you know, because um, we used to wait so long for home video. And I remember, um, you know, seeing a movie in the theaters in the 90s and having to wait maybe a year or more um, yeah. to get the VHS at home. And that also gave, you know, as you were just saying, it gave the movie a lot more time to find its audience. Whereas mm -hmm. now, like a movie comes out in theaters and if it doesn't find that audience in the first two weeks, it's considered a flop, you know, like yeah. there's. It's so to such a harsher uh, system now that it's it, it seems like, yeah, like how do you how do you make an impact now with that? So it's yeah, very interesting. <laughs> they want their they want their money quick. The one thing the studios became there's a great line in Wall Street. Michael Douglas says greed is good. That sums up the '80s cinema. It's perfect, mm -hmm. and it's in the forward. <laughs> um, they wanted their money back fast. So they, they closed that window of release. You're right. It was it was a year before we had Amadeus on home video, I remember. And Raiders of the Lost Ark took a long time to come out on video. But now, no, they want their money back fast. They want it in the, in the till, back into the studio, so they can make more movies. But I think what they need to ask themselves are the movies make they're making, the ones they want to make. Because I'll never watch Green Lantern again, ever. I'll never watch Ghost Rider again, ever. And there's so many films I'll never see again, ever. And most of them superhero or goofy teen comedies that we've all, you know, we've all watched them once or twice. Mm -hmm. I think there, there's a time coming and very soon because Martin Scorsese is so passionate about it when movies are going to become relevant again, going to mean something again. And I hope it's soon. It's great that Coppola's made a new film. He's made Megalopolis that comes out next year. And I think that's going to really help things. I hope, I hope. I hope so too. I'm very excited for that. Um, 
as somebody who works in a media department, like I spend a lot of time thinking about physical media and, you know, what it means that physical media is sort of like disappearing from people's daily lives. And um, I think a lot about too, about the fact that we are like mostly watching our stuff on streaming now too, and how that maybe like leads to like some um, like presentism, you know, <laughs> and how we watch movies. Like, cause when you go onto Netflix or whatever, most of what's there was made like in the last 10 years, you know, like it's getting yeah. harder for people to find those older things. Yes. And I also think you're, you're, you hit the nail on the head about something. Movies were meant to be seen by an audience. You know, we were meant to see a film collectively with 300, 500 other people and react together and scare together. Can you imagine Jaws watching Jaws by yourself? I mean, I remember, I remember there was popcorn in the air when that shark come out of the water and it was terrifying and a comedy or Tootsie without an audience. I, I just, I can't imagine. And that collective experience is, is disappearing. The one time I see films with an audience these days are, are the film festivals and I miss it. I really miss it because you don't have, you know, you're sitting in a room watching a big screen. It's great. You know, that you can watch a movie at home, but you really miss the other reaction. There's no one to turn to and say, wasn't that great? And uh, I miss that part. And I'm, I'm hoping gradually people will come back into the theaters. That's going to take a while, but I'm hoping that happens. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming to talk about this book and about your, your future book. I'm very excited to see uh, where the series goes. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I'll make sure you get a copy of the next one. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, listeners, it is now your turn. You are going to check out Cinema of the 70s by John H. Foote. It is a fantastic book, and you're going to learn a lot about the movies you already love and learn about new movies that you haven't seen yet. So please check it out. Thank you so much for joining us. It is now time to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.